Gospel of Matthew chapter 25, in just a little while we'll be reading from there. There was a mother who was preparing pancakes for her two sons, Kevin, who was age five, and Ryan, who was three years old. The boys began to argue over who was going to get the first, first pancake. So their mother saw the opportunity for a moral lesson. And she looked at the boys and she said, Son, if Jesus were sitting here, he would say, Let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait. Kevin turned to his younger brother and said, Brian, you be Jesus. <laughs> Pretty quick thinking older brother. <laughs> and I laughed at that when I first read it, and then I heard just a little bit. Because I realized something. Most of us want others to be Jesus rather than ourselves. You act like Jesus as you treat me instead of me acting like Jesus as I treat you. Last Sunday night, we had a defining moment, I believe, in the life of our church. How many of you happened to be able to attend the meeting last Sunday night? Raise your hand. This service. Good. Yeah, about, about 20 of you. All right. Uh, we had about 80 folks who were here last Sunday night and we talked about a church-wide meeting and we added it. I'm not going to review the whole thing, but, but I think it was a defining moment for us. It is a moment that I believe in God's kingdom work out of the Church of New Hope. It's one of those decisions that was made that I believe significantly will make a difference. And though I believe the decision was important, I firmly believe that the process by which the decision was arrived at last Sunday night was monumental. I believe that was significant. I believe we accomplished what the following story illustrates. As they were on their way home from church, a little girl turned to her mother and said, Mom, the pastor's sermon this morning confused me. Many of you have probably said the very same thing driving home from New Hope on Sunday morning. And the mother said, well, really, dear, what, what is it that confuses you? And the girl said, well, Mom, he said that God is bigger than we are. Is that true? And the mother answered, yes, yes, darling, that's absolutely true. The preacher was correct. God is bigger than we are. And then the little girl said, but Mom, he also said that God lives in us. Is that true? Yeah, that's true, too. Well, said the girl, if God is bigger than us, and if he lives in us, wouldn't he show through? <laughs> Ooh. The wisdom of a little girl. Wouldn't he show through? And I believe last Sunday night, God had the opportunity to show through all of us in the process as well as the outcome of what we did as a church family last Sunday night. For those of you who weren't there, let me just kind of capitalize on this just a moment. You see, last Sunday night, we had two opportunities to impact the kingdom of God's work through our fellowship in this community. We were provided with an opportunity to assist a ministry that we are already connected with, well called <coughs> ministries. That is a ministry where women who are incarcerated and are about ready to be paroled, go through 18 months of Bible classes and preparatory classes to aid them in their release, and upon appropriate completion of that, if they can get released to this particular area, they had a home to come to, to live in, for a year to 18 months, and they are get the support of a place to live, to have accountability, to have mentors, to have a church family come alongside of them, to possibly assist them in the securement of a job, and eventually another home. And you and I have seen Wanda, and Ruby, and Della, and Marta, just to name the four, that, that pop out right here in our head, that are right here and been in our church, and we've seen the difference that has made in their lives. And through a variety of circumstances, they lost the home that those women had lived in. And the two remaining women have been living in the homes of other women in our congregations. But in order for this, there's going to be several release in October, November, and December of this year. And they were in need of a home. And you and I, as a New Hope Church, have the resources to possibly help them do that. For what purpose? To change the lives of those who've been incarcerated. So how can we help? We could use a re 
available resources that we have. And what's that? We have some money in the bank. We have some money in the building fund. Whenever we get ready to launch again and to start developing that, we've had it from there for about four and a half years now. And we have been stewards of the money that was given about four years ago. We've put it in the bank. It's been in a CD. And we've been earning a whopping 0.40% interest on it for the last couple of years. <laughs> so we had an opportunity, because we have some available cash, to pay the purchase price of a home in a depressed market that everybody said, if you've got cash, this is the time to buy it because it is going to go back up in value over the next year to two years. We have the opportunity to do that. They will pay rent for the house, so we get investment back on our return. We provide a home for them at a reduced price so that they can provide a ministry that is very, very needed. And that is what we talked about last time. That was our opportunity last Sunday night. And we made the decision by 98% to proceed. We had discussion from both sides of the fence, the pros and the cons, asked very hard and serious questions. And one of the members of our church who asked the hardest questions, when all the discussion was finally over, he stood up and said, I think it's time to vote. You got the difference between money and making a difference in people's lives. God can worry about the money for us, and we will put ourselves out there to take care of God's ministry. And it was a vote, and it was done, and we're moving on in that direction now. That was an opportunity for us. Amen. So, with that being said, this has been a process that the board and staff have been going through for several months. And we talked about it late last week for the church. And so that, along with some other things in my own world, has prompted me to think about that incredible word called opportunity. And as we make our transition from the opportunity we've just completed here at New Hope, and that is to learn more about God's story as we spent 31 weeks in that, and we are going to head to the rest of the story starting next week for 13 weeks. How do we take the story we've learned about into our own life and let it transform our story so that we are now encouraged and enabled and empowered to share that story with somebody else who is in desperate need of being redeemed? having the chains drop from their lives and the stains removed from their life and experience what it means to be free. So how do we in our own personal lives, how do we in the life of the church, how do we in the activity of God's kingdom work, how do we define opportunity? Webster does it for us. Well, let me share what Webster said about it. And I don't mean Webster Webfoot. I mean Daniel Webster. All right. An opportunity is a good chance for advancement, progress, or growth. It's defined also as a favorable juncture of circumstances. Okay? A favorable juncture of circumstances. And I think that's kind of where I was about last Sunday night. I, I had a bias, of course. I, 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 I was pretty clear in my mind what I thought was the best thing for us to do as a church family. But you know, I'm not always right. <laughs> I'm not! Okay? And so, so here, here was the deal though. I came to that meeting and somebody said, are you worried about the outcome? I said, absolutely not. Because the outcome really wasn't, I don't want to say unimportant to me, but it wasn't the most important thing to me. We had an opportunity in front of us, and the process of going through that opportunity was very, very important. If this wasn't the way God wanted us to go, then there was another way for us to be using His kingdom work, and I hope we would be sensitive to that. And some opportunities, it's either or. It's the, uh, and sometimes it's both, like the Apostle Paul, when he said, for me to live is Christ. I have the opportunity to keep on living in this life, and, and if I do, I get to share Christ with other people for a little longer. But they said also, they're right in front of me is the opportunity to die. And he said, you know what? I don't mind that one either. If I live, I get to share Christ. If I die, I get to see Christ. These are both pretty good options. They are both good opportunities. And so... Because I thought about this whole thing of opportunity, and a lot of questions come to mind. So here's some, here's some good questions. Do any of you ever struggle with 
choosing opportunities? Is that, am I the only one that struggles with that occasionally? Or do you find some, you know, what, what do I do? Is, it, is this an opportunity? And is it a good one? Is it a bad one? And so here's some questions that for me over the last couple of months have been very, very helpful, thought-provoking, challenging, and sometimes almost impossible to answer. But the process was helpful. How do we discern a good opportunity from a right opportunity? Because good and right are not always one and the same for us. So how do I discern the difference between a good opportunity and a right opportunity? How do we determine if this opportunity is right for me? And does an opportunity have to be accepted? Just because I'm provided with an opportunity, do I have to take it? Number four, is processing an opportunity an opportunity for growth. In other words, as I go through the process, though the outcome may not be what I intended it to be, is that process going to be helpful and helpful for me? And is there a difference between a missed opportunity and a neglected opportunity? And I suggest to you a huge difference. A missed opportunity may happen simply because I was too busy, I was in too big a hurry, I missed it, I, 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 it just got by me somehow. But I wasn't willfully intending to miss the opportunity. And then a neglected opportunity, those I knew everything there was to know about it, but I chose to ignore it. I think there's a huge difference between missed and neglected. Now, being a pastor, I've got to bring this around with some spiritual side to it as well. So in evaluating opportunities, I need to look at some spiritual priorities. First of all, is this opportunity godly? Does this promote my relationship with God? Tim, you're saying, not every opportunity I have has to do with God. Really? 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 Is there another way I can say really? I'm trying to figure that one out. But really? Um, I used Gary Best in the last service. I, I don't see any Harley riders. In, do, am I missing any, any Harley riders in here? Maybe I don't know. Oh, oh, there you are. Brandon's here. All right. You're not old enough. No, I met, I met Gary when Brandon was just a boy. All right. Uh, that was almost 19 years ago. How old were you 19 years ago? That's pretty bad. Okay, he's 20. It's easier. How old are you now? 37. Okay, you were 17. You were a teenager. Okay? Just a kid. But but anyway, uh, when I first met Gary and 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 and, and Gary's wife. Charlotte. Charlotte, thank you. Uh, it was on the corner of downtown uh, Pulaski, downtown Clovis, Old Town. Cecil Spurlock introduced us. Hey, Cecil wouldn't even attend our church and he walks up to me and says, Hey, I want to introduce you to Gary Best. Gary, you need to go to his church. <laughs> that, that was the way we met. And uh, if you know Gary, if you've seen Gary, bald headed, big goatee, tats, leather jacket, all right, Harley, typical Harley rider, man. I'm saying, this guy, new hope. Come up here, you know what? That was the first Harley we had on the property. You come to 8 o'clock service, there's 8 to 10 of them out there. Amen. So here you say, where's this going? Here's the deal. His hobby is riding Harleys. Can ride a Harley be godly? Absolutely, if you use your hobby as an influence in the world that you are involved in, then it's godly. So, is there something godly about the opportunity? Is there a way it could be used? Does it promote my relationship with God? Number two, have you prayed about the opportunity? Have you just looked at the opportunity or have you prayed about it? Before you ever made a decision, favorable or negative, did you take an opportunity to pray? Number three, have I investigated the scriptures for direction, principle, and attitude as I approach the opportunity? Number four, is it helpful in fulfilling the plan and purpose of my life, or is it a distraction? Let me take something very mundane out of, out of Martin Shelley's life. Okay, About six weeks ago, Shelley and I went to the home show. And we walked by a booth that captured our attention. They had this beautiful barbecue island. 
exactly what for a couple of years we've been wanting. Like it. They offered us the model right there at a significantly reduced price. We did not buy emotionally. We did not say yes right then. We walked around the rest of the place. We went and I looked for a cinnamon roll because that would help me think more spiritually. <laughs> Satan got in my way, and they didn't even have the cinnamon roll booth at the home show this year. So what we had? A snow cone. We had a snow cone. We sat down away from there. We talked about it. We had been through, I've been through Crown. But together we went through financial peace last year with a lot of hard work, and some, some help, and some planning. We got out. Shelly and I got out of debt at the beginning of this year except for our house. Okay, so we were so we were saying, you know what, we can do this. It's not emotional. We've wanted it for a long time. We want to entertain in the backyard. This be so all the right. So we bought it. Brought it home on a Monday after the home show was closed, and on a Tuesday, the pipe in the wall burst. Okay? Had to tear a wall out, had to have, you know, you heard that story I read in a sermon. That week, fourteen hundred dollars worth of work on Ashley's car. Okay. Uh, that same week, and I won't go into the other, the, the, pool, the pool motor went out. Okay. So, this is, so we're saying, here's what we've spent, and here's where we are. And every time we looked out at that island on our patio, <laughs> it, it didn't look near as fun as it did on the showroom. <laughs> and Shelly was nervous about saying anything to me about it. She's the very practical one, all right? And uh, she didn't say anything, and finally one evening I said, let's put it on Craigslist and sell it. We got it for a very good price. I'm sure we can get our money out of it, uh, so let's just, let's just sell it. Let's not deal with this. And he said, Tim, what does this have? You, you know what? I don't know that we missed the sign that we shouldn't have bought it, but here's the deal. If it was a missed opportunity and I shouldn't have, don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. Don't be aggravated to say, maybe we blew it. Let's get rid of it. Let's look. Does, does this, is this a distraction in my life? We saw it on one day as an opportunity, and four days later, it was a huge distraction. <laughs> okay. So what are you going to do with it? Is this beneficial both short-term and long-term goals? When we made that decision, it was short-term. It wasn't long-term. Have I done my research, my due diligence? What are the risks and the rewards? And have we sought advice from wise and honest people? Wise and honest. Not all honest people are wise, and not all wise people always honest. Some of you are saying, I don't believe that. Let me illustrate. How many husbands do I have in the room? How many of you would say you're fairly wise as a result of experience, education, and God? There's, some, there's a certain amount of wisdom. Okay? All right. Very good. I will propose to all of you husbands, you are wise, but frequently you are not honest. How many have had your wives come to you and say, honey, how do I look in this dress? <laughs> you did not answer that question honestly, did you? If you did... You should not have raised your hand if you were wise. <laughs> so in, in assessing opportunities, is this wise and is this honest? Okay. Matthew chapter 25. Let's jump into the passage. There is a, a wonderful passage of scripture that helps us make the most, I think, of our opportunities. Begin at verse 14. Again, it will be like a man who was going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and another one one, each according to their ability. Then he went on his journey, and the man who had received the five went out at once and put the money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more, but the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of the servants returned and settled accounts. The man who had received the five brought another five with him. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many. Come and share your master's happiness. 
The man with the two talents came and said, Master, you entrusted me with two. I have gained two more. And his master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. Now, small point right here. Is there a different answer? Because the return was bigger for one than it was for the other? No. See, the, 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 the important principle here is not the return. It's not five is better than two. <coughs> the point is, both of them put to use what the master had entrusted to them. And he said, well done. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man. Harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. This guy had not taken the Dale Carnegie course of how to win friends and influence people. <laughs> he said, sir, I have perceived you to be a hard, tough man and you're a cheat. <laughs> Basically is what he told him. So I was afraid I went and hit your town to ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown together, where I have not scattered? Really? I have, uh, well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. He said, the least you could have done is put it in the bank and draw 0.40% interest. <laughs> We were doing the least, all right? That was one step better than this guy with one talent. We made a correction last Sunday night and all that. He took the talent from him and he gave it to the one who had ten. Everyone who has will be given more. And he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Throw that worthless servant outside. Wow. So today, quickly, we want to look at what mistakes did this servant make? What lessons does this parable teach us about life? You will discover that there's three lessons. Life is an adventure and responsibility. Number two, life is a treasure of diversity. And number three, life is a giver of many opportunities. And you and I have the privilege of allowing our lives to make a difference in the lives of others when we take the opportunities God gives to us. Where did this servant go wrong? The servant went wrong in several areas. First of all, the servant went wrong because he was full of excuses. He focused on every reason why he was unable to make a difference. The master is hard. I only have one. I'm afraid. Full of excuses. Number two, he had a bad attitude towards the master. I don't like this guy. He's a hard taskmaster. Number three, this guy thought he was self-sufficient. He did not involve anybody in a decision of what to do. He simply went and buried it all on his own. And number four, he was fearful of losing. He didn't play to gain. He played to not lose. Those are the errors. All of this reminds me of something I learned about the geography in the Middle East when I was in Bible college. The Sea of Galilee is one of the liveliest bodies of water in the region. It's full of life and activity. If you recall when some of the disciples fished in the Sea of Galilee, their nets were so full of fish they were on the verge of breaking. The Jordan River flows into the north and out of the south shores of the Sea of Galilee. The Jordan River continues south until it flows into another sea. However, that sea has no outlet. It only recedes from the Jordan, and that is where it ends. Anybody know what that sea is called? It's the Dead Sea. It's a lifeless body of water. The reason? No outlet. It receives, but it never gives. And that is a good illustration of what happened to that third servant. Those are the things that he did wrong. Now what does this parable teach you and me today about life? Several things. First of all, life is an adventure in responsibility. Those men did not own what they had. They were managing what the master had given them. The master in the story represents God. And the servant represents us. Verse 14 says, For it's just like a man who's going on a journey, called his servants and entrusted his possessions to them. What Jesus is teaching here is that whatever it is that we have, we have because God has entrusted to us for the purpose of managing that until he returns. There was a wealthy man one time who told the story of shopping with his 16-year-old son. His son saw a brand new computer system and he showed it to his dad. And the wealthy man said, son, that costs $2,000. And the son said, yeah, dad, but we've got the money. To which the dad said, we? <laughs> Who 
said anything about we. I, I, I know I've got the money, but I'm not sure you do, son. You see, the son misunderstood the nature of the relationship with his father. He thought that he could choose whatever he wanted to to spend the father's money on. Well, the father wasn't quite so careless. You see, God owns all. You and I must be careful how we treat his possessions. Their opportunities of responsibility. Number three, what are some of the things that you and I are managing for God? What are some things that we manage in our life? Of course, we've already mentioned money. You see, two uh, a talent. Talk about five talents, two talents, one talent. A talent in that culture would be equivalent to about two thousand dollars a talent in our our economics today. All right. So we manage money. Some have more. Some have less. If you think you're one who has less. You have more than somebody else who has less than you. So some have more, some have less. How about possessions? Some have more, some have less. How about health? Look at our bulletin. Some have more, some have less. What about time? Common ground here, folks. Each day, every single one of us has the same amount of time. I'm not talking about your age. I'm talking about this day. All of us are here are still sitting up taking nourishment. You and I today, on this Sunday, September the 2nd, every single one of us have the same amount of time today. Life is an adventure of responsibility. And if we want to allow God to use us to make a difference in the world, we must be willing to be responsible with that which God has entrusted to us. Not only is life an adventure, but life is a treasure of diversity. We are not all the same. Five, two, one in the story that we read to you today. Who needs a world full of clones? Life is this treasure of diversity. I like what Zig Ziglar said, but in one of his books he said, you are the only person on earth who can use your abilities. I cannot use your abilities. If I could, I'd be the best singer in the world. But I can't carry a tune. You can't use my abilities. I only have one. I can shoot my mouth off. <laughs> That's it. You know, in athletics, particularly in baseball, the sport of baseball, they talk about a five-tool player. They say that's a player who's got all the tools. He can run, he can hit, he can catch, he can throw, and he's got the mind for the game. A five-tool player. But not all of us are five-tool Christians. We don't all have the same ability. We all have the same Jesus living within us. But God doesn't expect everything. There's a sense that He expects the same from all of us. And that is to commit what we have to Him. The outcome is going to be different for all of us. And just because one is more doesn't make it better. It's making our resources available for God to use. Maybe a person can't teach or preach, but you know what? You can pray for those who do. Maybe a person can't sing, but you can run sound. And I'm not saying you can't sing, darling. All right? <laughs> then you can set up equipment. You can teach children. We can't all do everything, but all of us can be engaged in making a difference in something, even if it's just one. Here's the thing to remember. We have what we have because God has given it to us to manage. Whether it's one to five, He wants us to mature in a place of selfless giving rather than hoarding. I had never heard of the program Hoarders until about two years ago I was taking an interview with a couple preparing for a memorial service. And I asked them, what is your mom's favorite program? And they said, Hoarders. Okay, now I had never heard of it before. I really never heard the expression hoarding used in the way it's on that program. So when they said hoarders, I was thinking about W-H-O-R-E. Okay? So I'm saying, well, that's on public television? <laughs> and then they, they said, Pastor, we're talking. And, and, and so anyway, I got home and I told Shelly about it. And we did a little channel surfing one evening and we found the program. Oh. That's an example of the Dead Sea. <laughs> they take everything in, but nothing goes out. And it's all just dead, all right? It's all there. But if you're a hoarder, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, write the program. They can help you. Um, but I wonder how many of us 
spiritually are hoarders. We take and we take and we take. We go to Bible class after Bible class. We go to service after service. And we take and we take. And it never flows out. See, I believe the mistake of the third servant was that he had started feeling sorry for himself because he didn't have as much as the others. <coughs> Life is a treasure of diversity. And I thank God that we are not all the same. I am glad that nobody is like me. One is enough. I'm sure you feel the same way. God knows what He's doing when He made each of us differently. Third, life is a giver of opportunity. Life is an adventure of responsibility. It's a treasure of diversity. It's a giver of opportunity. The big mistake the third Satan made is that he thought he couldn't make a difference with what he had. He looked at the other two and said, I can't do what they can do. He didn't even consider doing the least profitable thing, and that was putting it in a bank. Investment, 0.40 interest. He could have done that, but he didn't even consider the minimum. i got to tell you, though, I would be a hypocrite if I didn't confess to you that on occasions I am guilty of doing the same thing as that third servant. I listened to a Chuck Swindoll message pull out a major Thomas teaching tape and I say, Tim, why even try to prepare a sermon for less? You can't hold a candle. I read about administrative skills of guys like Heibels who runs a church of 10,000 and I say, wow, six, what am I doing? Over my head. And it's at that moment I'm reminded of a quote that someone told me years ago, whatever is over my head is still under Jesus' feet. And I say, okay, God, it's not, it's not the number of gifts I have to invest. It's that I invest whatever gifts you have given us. Now, I know I'm not doing this alone. How many of us, have, how many of you have quit at things because you didn't think you stacked up to the competition? Instead of focusing on what you do have, it's so easy to start focusing on what we don't have. Malcolm Fry used to quote this, and I didn't know where it came from or even what the title was until I researched it and found it this week. I love Google. You just put part of a line in and it tells you things. <laughs> R.L. Sharp wrote this thing. It's called A Bag of Tools. Isn't it strange that princes and kings and clowns that caper and sawdust rings and common people like you and me are builders for eternity? Each is given a bag of tools, a shapeless mass, and a book of rules. And each must make their life is over, a stumbling block, or a stepping stone. <clears throat> what are you and I doing with the opportunities of this thing that all of us have in common? It's called life. Are we using our life to make a stepping stone or a stumbling block? President Roosevelt one time said, do what you can with what you have right where you are. Don't always look for something else elsewhere. Remember the boy who fed, uh, used five loaves and two fishes, and Jesus fed 5,000? God doesn't just do that with money. He does that with our lives. Life is a giver of opportunity. We can truly make a difference with our lives if we'll be willing to make the most of the opportunities that God gives to us in the way in which we live our lives. How do we make the most of opportunities? Understand that God has determined what you will be responsible for. God has given you five or two or one. Somewhere in there, it's you and me. Use what God has given us for His purpose. I remember years ago when I was working at Fresno Bible House and we brought Lloyd John Ogilvie to town to do a breakfast event for pastors. Lloyd John Ogilvie, former chaplain of the U.S. Senate and pastor of Hollywood's First Presbyterian Church, he has a voice like God. I said when I introduced him way back then, if I get to heaven and God doesn't sound like Lloyd Ogilvy, I'll be disappointed. <laughs> I was scared after I said it. I was afraid God might strike me or something. Because I'm sure God's voice will be much better, but that is how rich and beautiful Ogilvy's voice was. And I remember, I remember Lloyd reading this to a group of pastors, and I want to read it to you with this out of close this morning. When Christ wants to drill a person and skill a person and thrill a person, to create so strong and courageous a person that all will be amazed, watch his method, watch his ways. 
how he persistently perfects whom he royally elects, how he calls a person to be filled with his spirit, to behold his glory, to be shaped and made in his image, to love like him, to forgive like him, to serve like him. How he bends but never breaks when his goodness he undertakes. How the person's gold he refines with love that never declines and a ministry that only God can define. How he uses whom he chooses and with vision he infuses and with courage he induces to try his splendor out. Our Lord knows what he's about. His promises are true and his strategy it involves you and you and you you realize you are part of his strategy? The servant who was given one talent was part of God's strategy. And he wasted the opportunity. Are you prepared to be part of God's strategy in the 21st century? The next 13 weeks we are going to look and discover that you and I are part of the strategy because we are men and women of influence and the world is where he's placed us. We may not be skilled in five tools, but all of us have one. Will we make them available for the master's use? Let's pray. Father, I don't know what opportunities folks are grappling with right now, but I trust that they have found some biblical direction today on how to evaluate the opportunity, to investigate the opportunity, to make corrections in the midst of the decision-making of opportunity, and discover that the worst mistake we can make to neglect the opportunity, to simply bury it in the ground, do nothing with it. Father, thank you that you have illustrated for us how you would like our lives to be lived in devotion to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.